Hey Creepsters, this is Allison from Midland, Texas, a small oil patch town, and you're listening to my two favorite girls, Carrie and Donna, with A Paranormal Chicks. And remember, creep it real. And we are Paranormal Chicks. Sinister Sightings 90. I cannot fucking believe that. We're like 10 weeks away from 100 Sinister Sightings. And you thought we would never, like, you thought we would run out. I mean, we still could. (laughs) Her butthole puckers every time. Every fucking time. (laughs) I'm like, every time I see an email come through, I'm like, thank God. (laughs) Another one. Okay, okay. (sighs) Okay, we we got another week. (laughs) (laughs) Because, uh, like, in my head, literally nobody listens. Look, I get it. I get so it. So it's like, so the 10 people who have listened have emailed us now. They're, they're, we, they got to be out of stories. Right? Well, they're not. Because so, so many people are like, hey, I work in a haunted hotel. Looking at you, Anthony. Share us those, share us those stories. You know, whatever. Words. It's episode 90, and I still don't understand. You're right, because it's sinister sightings. <laughs> You know what I mean? Episode Sinister Settings, episode 90. <laughs> Mother Hunter. Number Cruncher. <laughs> well, you know who understands words? Allison, because she did a good intro. Um, And you know what? What? The very last one of the year from hell. Oh, my God. Allison, you have bookend in the year from hell. <laughs> <laughs> you have said that twice of late. What, bookending? bookending it? And you say it like it just flows off your tongue. <laughs> Booking book ended in it. And it's very difficult for me to say book ending it. Well, that's your rural. Yeah. It's my fucking kryptonite. <laughs> yeah. It just, just rolls off your tongue. But yes, Allison fucking killed it. Way to round out the year. Definitely. And your little kid in the background. Very cute. And y'all know the drill. If you want to kick ass like Allison, you want all that fucking bonus content. Because, you know, there's a shit ton there. We've been doing Patreon a while now. There's a whole lot of fucking content. Head on over to patreon.com slash the APC podcast. Okay, this one is called Work Ghost Update. Hey girls, let me just start by saying I completely had a fangirl moment when you read my stories. So the title says Work Ghost Update, but I have two updates. I also had the dream story, the one when I dream of someone's death before it happens. Yes, I do tell them. I realized when I tell them, it saves their life. Everyone I have told is still alive today. Sad news, those I don't tell are no longer with us. It's very scary. Good thing I haven't had any dreams in years, not since my uncle's passing. The uncle in that story. Now, second story update. You guys wanted to know where I worked. I work at Sephora. I laughed so hard when you guys thought it was Michael's. (laughs) Oh, God. I don't remember us guessing, but oh, fuck. (laughs) And the lovely, says sarcastically, is back. And this time it's slamming doors and knocking down things off the shelves and playing with our sinks. It seems to always happen when I'm alone. This time, my lead was right next to me. So this happened before the world shut down due to the pandemic. I was in the back room, not on break this time, just grabbing things to take out to the sales floor. The door to the office that has to weigh a good amount just slams shut. I jumped so high. So I asked on our headsets. (laughs) I still was picturing Michael's. (laughs) Oh, God. Okay. I asked on our headsets if anyone was in the office. Everyone who was working that day was on the sales floor. Right after I asked that, the door that leads to the back room from the bathrooms slams shut. I said, nope, not today, Satan, and ran back on stage. When I went and told my managers, they did not believe me. Guess what? The security cameras called it all. Oh, shit. No one shut those doors. No one living, that is. Ooh, dun dun dun. Why does your dun 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 go up? I don't know. I don't know. Everything's happy, okay? 
she's like, yay, 2021 is almost here. (laughs) After this, we now have things falling off the shelves in the back when no one is around. When we are closing at night, we have procedures we do, stocking what's empty, putting back things clients change their mind on at the register. I had something in the center of the register counter. Next thing I know, I heard a thump on the ground. I go to check what it was. There it was on the floor, the product I had centered on the counter. Next thing, and the last thing to happen that I noticed, was our sink being on. This could have been someone who accidentally left the sink on when done using the restroom, but everyone denied it. I came into the back room and noticed the sink was on. As a good person, I shut it off and started my shift. So at this point, I think we have a very, very needy ghost. I love you girlies so much. I never miss an episode, and I am obsessed with the group. It keeps my spirits up when I'm having a hard time. Remember, don't get scared and creep it real, Sabrina. Um, I see running sinks all the fucking time. I was about to say that. Like It, it stopped for a long time, Yeah, and then it kind of picked back up, and it's been a while again. But when she was traveling for school? All the fucking time. What's that mean, y'all? I mean, like, running. Like, sometimes it would be a trickle, but sometimes it would be like, <laughs> running. Yeah. That's so crazy. Also, hopefully none of that shit was the breakable, like, foundation bottles and stuff. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. That, that shit's expensive. expensive. <laughs> no I mean, at Michael's and at <laughs> I mean, <laughs> Sephora. I mean. Apparently, Michael's does not uh, ad match anymore, so that shit <laughs> really expensive, and I am still pissed about we it. We are very mad. <laughs> very upset. Also, Sabrina, act like we're on stage, and can you tell me if It Cosmetics is actually good or not? Because I use it, and I like it, but I want to know if you like it. Okay, thank you. Bye-bye. Is it all it's cracked up to be? <laughs> dumb. <laughs> I, I, could. I couldn't even get it out. It was so dumb. It's so dumb. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. She's like, and can y'all talk about the ghost? <laughs> <laughs> Does it wear makeup? We're going to to make this about y'all. <laughs> I do want to know. Serious question. Oh, God. <laughs> what higher up at Sephora decided to make that the uniform? Mm. Mm-hmm. Really and truly. Who said, let's pick the most unflattering garment Known to man. Let's put it on these employees. I mean, just a thought. Mm-hmm. Also, did you do the told you so, told you so, told you so? I would have. I was just thinking that. When that fucking <laughs> door slammed on that damn video, I'd have been like, slow turn to him and been like, uh-huh. now what? Uh-huh. Yep. Okay. All right. Sorry, Sabrina. We got way off. Whew. All right. Next one is, I just remembered I saw a murder victim once. Guess who's back? Back again. (laughs) Cat is back. Time to grin. Hey, she can rhyme, Carrie. (laughs) Guess who's back? Guess who's back? Guess who's back? Terrible, terrible. Eminem would be very ashamed. Eminem, literally anybody listening to this. (laughs) I mean, maybe it sounds good on your 2.0. Yeah. She said, I'm I'm going to be very disappointed if y'all didn't wrap that. Well, that wasn't really a wrap, okay? All right, moving on. Anyway, I have another sinister sighting, finally. I mean, except that it's murder. That super sucks. But I have returned. So that's got to temper it somehow. And it's not nearly as terrible as the last one I sent in. So... June 7th, 2017, I'm driving on my way to my parents' house on a route I don't usually take, and I see a ton of cop cars and SWAT cars surrounding a house on the corner where I was supposed to turn. So I was like, huh, weird, and turned onto another road. Now, I have to explain my reaction. The, huh, weird, is probably the reaction anyone in Topeka, Kansas has when we see a SWAT team. I joke that I'm planning to start an underground gambling ring where people place bets on whether or not there's actually someone in the house SWAT is having the standoff with. Here's some insider knowledge for anyone who wants to get in on it. Put your money on the house being empty. I'll give you all a second to place your bets on this one before I tell you the outcome. Okay, bets placed. Here's a sitch. 
Viviana Vasquez lived in the home with her three children, three years old, 10 years old, and 14 years old. She had just filed for divorce in April from her husband of 11 years, Pedro Enriquez. Around 7 a.m. on June 6, he showed up at the home and began brutally assaulting her before knocking her unconscious, dragging her to his car, throwing her inside, and taking off. This was witnessed by neighbors and the three kids. Pedro only kidnapped Viviana. He left the kids at the house. It seems like the kids were removed from the house by someone before the police showed up, but I can't find anything about that. The police were informed about the kidnapping immediately after it happened, but they didn't show up until around 5.15 p.m. With the information that it was a kidnapping, they initially intended to enter and look for evidence. One officer thought he saw some movement in the back door, and they immediately pulled back and called in SWAT. The thinking was apparently that it was a hostage situation rather than a kidnapping. Anyway, the crisis negotiators yelled at the house through loudspeakers until 8 p.m., when they forced entry into the house and found it to be empty. Tally for everyone who chose that outcome. Later that night, 10-year-old Pedro Enriquez Jr. told the press what he witnessed. This part is hard, y'all, so brace yourselves. My mom started screaming my name, and then I went downstairs, and I saw my dad drag her from her hair all the way outside. Pedro Jr. was joined by his grandpa, Viviana's dad, who begged Pedro Sr. to bring her back. They ended their press conference with Pedro Jr. saying, I love you, Mom, and I hope you come back soon. Ugh, Christ. I remember that press conference, and it killed me. I'm actually dead right now. Probably should have mentioned that like a year ago when I joined the APC group. So the next day, June 8th, I'm again going back to my parents' house because I'm a baby who has to see her parents every day. Or maybe I was picking up laundry. No, I was picking up my dog. That was it. Anywho, I took the route that I usually take this time, which goes through a not-so-great neighborhood. Sidebar, every time I talk with someone who grew up in the area and I tell them that I lived on the last corner before you enter that neighborhood, they all go, isn't that the neighborhood where the meth house blew up? And yes, yes it is. It's also where a truck full of rednecks tried to kidnap my brother and my dog, and they had to hide in this big thicket until they got bored and drove off. And this was last year, so it's not like they tried to kidnap a kid. My brother's 30. Kansas, everybody. All right, it was around 5 p.m. when I reached this small bridge over a little creek, and I noticed police starting to wrap crime scene tape around the area, a ton of police cars, and at least three news vans. So I started looking around to see what's up. I look to my right and see a pile of something on the ground in front of the chain link fence that keeps the people out of the creek. And I just knew. I was the last car to get through that bridge before they got the tape across it, probably making me the last civilian to see Viviana Vasquez's body. She was less than half a mile from the home where Pedro Sr. had been living while they were estranged. It was maybe three blocks down or two blocks over from where she had been kidnapped and she had been strangled to death. Pedro Sr. was nowhere to be found. When Viviana was still missing, all reports were that he was probably headed to Mexico. I can't imagine how long he had her before he killed her and dumped her body, but I hope it was quick. All reports were still that he was headed to Mexico, and I don't know if that's racism or what, but he headed in basically the opposite direction or parallel direction and then opposite direction. 30 minutes northeast. I don't need to do more math or geography or whatever the heck that thing is. He wasn't heading to Canada or anything, though. He was found and arrested in Jefferson County, Kansas at 8.30 a.m. on June 30th, 2017. So he clearly wasn't really, quote-unquote, headed anywhere. He was just hanging out. I don't think there are any actual towns or cities in Jefferson County because I never hear about them. He was found near 13th Street and Rice Road, which is where quite a few people get arrested. So I guess maybe there's some farm home harboring criminals. I actually just went out and looked at the Google Street View, and I'm going to send some screenshots of four or five places it could be. They're all terrifying. He took a plea, thank God. I can't imagine his poor children and her poor parents having to endure a trial. He pled guilty to first-degree murder, aggravated kidnapping, and aggravated battery. He received a life sentence for the murder, 13 years and 9 months for the kidnapping, and 3 years and 7 months for the battery, all to be served consecutively. 
Her whole family, including the kids who were now 4, 11, and 15, were in the court to give and or hear victim testimony. The kid's grandpa told the court that the kids cry almost nonstop, day and night, and that the judge shouldn't hold back on her sentence for the kids' sake, because they would be further traumatized by any sentence she handed down, so it might as well be the harshest that she was allowed to give. The piece of shit looked directly at the family and asked for forgiveness and said, I know there's nothing I can do. I mean, you can die slowly in prison. That's something you can do. You can pick a fight with the most racist dude on the block. That's another thing. I feel like there's a lot of things you can do. Not to bring her back, of course, but to make us all feel a little bit better. He has to serve 17 years for the kidnapping and battery, but credit for good behavior is allowed for those. However, he must serve 25 years for the murder no matter what, and no good time is allowed for that. I don't know how he could possibly be paroled, but that 25 years means he's eligible for parole in 2043. I'm putting a reminder in my calendar to make sure I'm around to fight to keep him in prison in 2043. He was also required to pay $5,000 in fines. I looked up how much Kansas judges can impose in fines, and it's up to $800,000 for all of his crimes, so I'm not entirely sure why Viviana was only worth $5,000. So I didn't mean for this to be this long, but Viviana's been forgotten in the two years since her murderer was sentenced, and I just wanted to tell her story. I can't find her eldest son, but the ones who were 3 and 10 at the time seem to be doing well on Facebook, which makes me happy. Anyway, sorry all of my stories are downers. I keep trying to find somebody I know who has a ghost story, but apparently I'm surrounded by skeptics, like myself. But still, I've got to have a believer somewhere, right? Hopefully a ghost story next time. Love you chicks. Creeping it real and to be honest, still a little scared of exploding meth labs. Cat. I have no doubt that in 2043, like that, there is a reminder. Mm-hmm. There is a reminder. And I love that you went and did the street view. Hell, I thought for that part, she was going to have driven by the house. Oh, <laughs> very true. I mean, gas though. True. Mm-hmm. Dangerous though. True. Cat girl, you know we love you and your stories. Yes, how you write, I love it. Besides that rap, because who I murdered that? I mean, not in a good way. We know. <laughs> we were all there. We'll cut it. He, he was like, couldn't do it. But that is very sad about Viviana, and that is so like, whoa, to be the last car led on that bridge. I know. I I don't know how you like find yourself in these situations, like. She's Literally, that person, yes, you know? Yes, like nothing like that. I mean, knock on wood. I mean, thankfully, have I ever been that close to anything like that? I mean, you really are Jessica Fletcher. You may as well just break out your typewriter. <laughs> I mean, or your MacBook, you know, which, whichever. Or make a career out of this, girl. Right? I'm just glad they found him so quickly. And then, again, like you said, he didn't go to trial, and he did take a plea. And I just don't understand why a life sentence isn't a fucking life sentence. And if they're supposed to be served consecutively, that doesn't sound fucking consecutively. You know what I mean? That's fucking stupid. Okay, the next one. My daughter introduced me to you guys on our way to New Orleans in June, and I was hooked. I decided that I needed to share my mom's sinister sightings with you. Unfortunately, I did not inherit her ability to see ghosts. I only smell or hear them. I really want to see one, though. Anyway, we lived in a house in Madison, Tennessee when I was in the sixth grade that was haunted with three ghosts. The first one we named Henry. You'll understand why in a second. Henry would pace around upstairs and man, did he have some heavy feet. The second ghost was a lady who was bathing slash drowning in the bathtub. She would call out for Henry. See why we named Henry? My mom told me about the third ghost like this. Mom, did you see the little girl in the hallway? Me. No, there was nobody there. Mom, you walked right through her. How did you not see her? Gee, thanks a lot, Mom. Anyways, she went on to describe the little girl as always wearing a yellow dress, white pinafore, long blonde curls, and she was crying and holding a teddy bear. We were never able to find out for sure who they were, but we always figured that Henry killed his wife and daughter and then went upstairs and killed himself. Oh, and for the kicker for the story, 
The house was owned by a prominent family who also owned the local funeral homes. I always hated the basement in that house because of the stone slabs in the basement along the walls. My active imagination had them laying the bodies out down there to prepare them. And with the way the house was laid out, it would make a great funeral parlor. Of course, my bedroom was the one the bodies would have been laid out in. Yay me. I will have to write in later to tell you about the ghosts in my childhood home. My sister still lives there, and yes, it is still haunted. Sorry for being so long. Creep it real and keep the stories coming, Lisa. Lisa, that was so short. I need all those stories. What in the my girl is going on? That legit, like legit. Oh, nope. Don't like that. <laughs> Meanwhile, I'm like, all the counter space you have down there built in. Uh-uh. No. <laughs> I mean, it's like a built-in charcuterie board. <laughs> Too far? That was a fucking Donna joke. Well, I couldn't say the word, so there. <laughs> <laughs> but like Carrie said, we need all the stories. Send them in. Well, speaking of that, the next one says, Hey, y'all, I've sent in a few stories and I have a few more to come, but due to the series of events taking place at my current workplace, I'll go by the name Ace. I've worked in my fair share of haunted pubs, but that's all run-of-the-mill shit. White ladies walking up hallways, glassware moving, pots banging, but what I wasn't prepared for in my new line of work was a haunted plane. I started working for an air freight company a few years ago. After a few months, excitement hit as we were told we were getting a new plane. New for us anyway. The night comes for me to see said plane, and as I walked up to it, my anxiety grew the closer I got to it. And the closer I got to it, the closer I got to my coworker, leaning towards my coworker, who knows I'm a bit on the sensitive side, but scoffs at it. I ask, doesn't the bullet holes in the side make it unflyable? Like, how did they get there? I mean, that seems like a reasonable question. Mm Mm-hmm. He gave me a confused look and said, what bullet holes? Oh, Christ. Nope, 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 nope. I can fucking see them. Not wanting to sound like a nutter, I asked the pilots a few random questions about her history. Turns out she was originally used for freight drops over war zones. Mm -mm. And had been shot at with the bullet-ridden panels later replaced. I noped my way out of there and put it in the back of my mind. A few weeks go by and I'm working alone at night in the back of our little truck. I was sorting freight when the whole thing starts rocking back and forth. I jump quickly out, ready to catch a co-worker and nothing. I walk out to the airstrip and there's no one. All airport personnel has gone for the night and I'm the only one on shift. Looking up and down the airstrip, my gaze fell upon the creepy ass plane. It's dark and I can only see it faintly lit up by a few lights from the main building. My eyes adjusted to the lack of light, and I see a dark figure standing next to the plane. I call out and say, Oi! Yes, it's Oi! (laughs) I can't! I can't! Is it really Oi? Yes, it's Oi! Oh, my God, okay. (laughs) How did you know? I don't know, I just did. Okay. Oi! I can't! (laughs) I can't! Why is that so silly? I mean, I know like Australian people a lot say it, but I don't know. I just it, it just pictured Bridget Jones. I don't know why it just came to me. I call out and say, "Oi, you're not meant to be here." I'll call the cops. And he walks behind the plane and dissipates. Like all I could see was his legs, and with each step, he slowly disappeared. Fuck that! I'm out. I take off to my car and waited for the night shift to start. And now to the day that I saw my doppelganger and lived to tell the tale. I was out on pickup and was driving kind of on autopilot as I've driven that road hundreds of times. I see a truck oncoming. I straighten up in my seat and give him a little wave. As he passes, I notice another van behind it. My van. My motherfucking van. With me in it. Other me was in my work uniform and my Akerba hat, which I normally wore but had forgotten to grab that day. As we passed, we gave each other a confused as fuck look, and I was so focused on watching myself that I hit the gravel on the side of the road, which brought me back to facing in front of me. When I looked in my rearview mirror, it was only the truck. I literally slunk around for weeks looking over my shoulder, jumping at every shadow and pretty much waiting to die. 
but I'm still here. Even on our not haunted planes, I can always tell when we have special cargo on board before the pilot says B.O.B., which signals body on board. Yep, sometimes we have a coffin fly in from the little island. One particular day, we were unloading. We get to a large box. The pilot says, as we're bringing it to the back, oh yeah, I forgot that we have a coffin. Then as he's lifting it, he says, bloody hell, it's heavy. Don't you have coffins here? He chuckles to himself and I look at him and go, um, yeah, this one's occupied. His face went paler than I've ever seen anyone go before. And he stammered, there's been a body behind me the whole flight. I, uh, I laughed and said as I walked away, only going to worry if it knocks. (laughs) Which brings me to my shift only last Friday night, working alone again and listening to APC blasting through our speaker When a new episode starts, just as your intro does its creepy bit, I hear the bleepy noise from the speakers disconnecting Bluetooth, then instantly I hear as if imitating your intro, boom, 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 on the metal shipping container wall right in front of me. For anyone who's opened a shipping container before knows that it makes a pretty god-awful noise as you unlock the bars and open it that... I had not heard. That container had not been opened since I arrived at the depot. This thing has always given me the creeps. If I have to go in there, any time of the day, it's dark inside, like pitch black at the back. We have a light, but it takes a bit to set up, and no one has time for them extra steps in their lives, so normally I'll just open the door as far as I can to let in as much light and phone flashlight as I can. Then I go in and get what I need and power walk back out again, with the extra energy from not turning on the light. (laughs) I always feel like something's behind me, and sometimes I hear footsteps. So now I'm back to standing outside hearing loud bangs and trying not to shit myself, literally because I was being stubborn and trying not to go until I had finished my shift and could sit there for like three-fourths of an hour on my phone peacefully before going home to hubby and moody preteen. I mean, mood. (laughs) I mean, I totally feel that and I don't even have a hubby or a preteen right no I I do I feel that too relatable Mm -hmm. do I go into the container you bet your arse I did boom 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 again went your ghostly imitation intro armed with my phone's flashlight I walk into the pitch black container to roughly where the bangs were coming from Right? Listen here. I've had enough. Jack, if this is you, I'm going to kick your arse till your nose bleeds. (laughs) Threatening my best friend that works a night shift. Nope, he would have laughed by now. Boom, 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 boom. Right in front of me. Nope, nope, nope. Just fuck nope. Go away. Bleep goes my phone as it reconnects and Donna's laughter fills the area and everything feels lighter. I rush out of the container and go back to work as quickly as I can so I can get the fuck out of there. I haven't worked alone since, but I will be again on Friday, and I think I'll be going to the toilet before I go into the depot to work. Oh, my God. Whew. Yeah, go (laughs) shit before work. Whew. And I think my laugh would be the scarier part, but I'm glad it made everything feel lighter, but yeah. Oh, my God. I'm still stuck on you saw bullet holes and nobody else fucking saw bullet holes. Right? Oh, my gosh. And your doppelganger. That was a fucking glitch in the Matrix, and, like, legit, I even knew to be like, and you still a fucking love? Right? Oh, my gosh. Mm -mm. See, I could not work alone and stuff like that. That, Mm -mm. mm -mm. Every sound, I'd be like, who's there? Mm Mm-hmm. And I make a lot of sounds. Also, he was that creeped out because there was a body there? Like, what'd you think? I don't know. The, you know, the pilot. Yeah. I mean, it's different if you're like, oh, yeah, there's a coffin. And then you're like, oh, wait, there was a body in there? But even still, like, there's a coffin back there, so I don't know. I guess I would just assume there was a bo- I don't know. I'm yeah. not creeped out by dead bodies, though. Yeah. Well, you've worked in the medical field for a while. Yeah. I'm not really creeped out by dead bodies. Like, I would be if I, like, was, if I was locked in a morgue, I'd be creeped the fuck out. But you've never been to a morgue. Right. But also being locked anywhere. Well, being locked somewhere where you can't get out of anywhere is weird. But, yeah, like, just knowing something behind me is, like... Not a big thing, but... Yeah. I mean, it's not going to jump out and go boogity, 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 you know? True. I mean, it could, but... But it is not. (laughs) I mean, like they said, it's not going knock, knock, knock. Yeah. All right, this one. 
Hello, my name is Madison, and let me just say I love your podcast. Not going to lie, one time I was so scared by a story that I jumped when I heard my phone ring. Here's my story. In 2019, my parents and I moved into a house. It's fairly new. I think it was built in 1995. And in the beginning, there was nothing paranormal going on. That did not last for long. Around two weeks after we moved into the house, I watched a pan fly off the stove. My dumbass said, what in the hell is your problem? And, well, everything went downhill from there. Chairs started getting moved all over. Drumsticks would appear in random places. Like chicken or like... Yeah, I'm like chicken. Chicken, ice cream, or the... <laughs> <laughs> I forgot about the ice cream. Ooh, Ooh but that get melty. Mm-hmm, but... Um, with the caramel in the middle. Mm-hmm. Mm. And that last bite with the cone. Co- oh, oh, with the God. chocolate. Mm-hmm. <laughs> okay, I'm okay. sorry. Continue. Okay. And stoves and speakers would get turned on and off. But that was just the little things. For a while, every night I had sleep paralysis. A different thing every night. Then the fucking garage shit started going, well, let's just say badly and loudly. My dad was fixing his car, so it was up on those things that keep the car up in the air. I don't know what they're called, and I ain't no dictionary. Anyways, the car fell onto the ground. That was the first of many scary occurrences. I've got to go to work, but if you want me to, sometime I can send some other experiences in. Love the podcast, Madison. A jack? Is that what it's called? Is it a jack when it's all up like that? I don't know. We're going to call it a jack. I'm not a dictionary either. That's what we're going to go with. Holy fucking shit. If that, if he had been under that, right. he could have died. I was going to say riser, so I have no idea. Jack sounds more right. That's really scary. That, I mean, the little bit of stuff was scary to me. Like the moving of chairs, the moving... Of said drumsticks, I still need to know which one, but all of that is scary. And I need to know all the other stories you have. Yes, send them all in because that's some serious fucking shit. Also, where do you work, Madison? (laughs) I need to know all the deeds. Well, at the very least, we're glad y'all are all safe. Yes. Whew. All right. Hey, ladies. I love your podcast, which I've recently discovered while I groomed dogs all day. I don't have a super lengthy story, but I'll do my best to make it worth the read. About three or four years ago, while camping next to what we call Goose Pond, I woke up sometime during the early morning before the sun rose, and since we, my husband and our two kids, were all cramped into a two-person tent, my head was pretty close to the side of the tent. As I woke up, I heard something whisper very plainly in my ear, death. Oh my god. I was instantly awake. I got up, opened the tent to see if anyone else was awake or near us. There was no one. A year later, I was drinking my morning coffee with my best friend, which we did every morning. I poured the creamer into my coffee and walked away for just a minute. And when I came back, there was a clear as fuck skull in my coffee cup. I showed my best friend, to which she replied, Jut, her hubby, had an MRI scheduled in a week to make sure his cancer hadn't come back. Well, it had. A golf ball-sized tumor in his brain, and since this was the third time he was fighting cancer, the chances looked very bleak. Not long after his biopsy, I moved to Arkansas with my mom due to my husband and I separating. I was on an antidepressant, which made me have very vivid dreams every night. I dreamt that I was standing in the mirror freaking out because half of my face was drooping. In my dream, I told my friend that I was having a stroke and we both freaked. I woke up to a phone call telling me Jut had just had a stroke and was paralyzed on his entire right side. I won't torture y'all with all the details of his dying process, but I just thought it was odd to have death whispered in my ear and then I experienced the worst death of a friend whom I moved in with to take care of until he took his last breath. Thanks for listening and creep it real. Thanks, Alicia. Oh, that's so sad. But you're an amazing friend. Yes. Wow. Like, whoa. So sorry for your loss and your friend's loss. Also, I would never be able to see a skull in my coffee because it's all too light after I add my whole thing of creamer. Just saying. Jesus, Mary, Joseph. 
Also, I've literally had Bell's palsy before, so I'd be like, oh, great, I'm getting fucking Bell's palsy again if right. I had that dream. <laughs> but really and truly, you're, we are sorry for your loss, and your friends are very lucky to have you, and you get ready, Donna, because you fucking moving in if anything like that ever happens to me or Colby. Okay, thanks. Mm, Colby's got you. You've got Colby. I've got Marley. Yeah, and her friend had Ja, and she, her, and, and had her too. What the fuck are we friends for then? Look, you need to take a, a a page out of Alicia's book. Look, I was here when you almost died last year. Colby's got catching up to do. And I was here when you almost died this year. Exactly. So the no one that's going to be in my future has a lot of catching up to do. <laughs> Tiffany was like, bitches, I was here when both of y'all tried to die. Right. <laughs> Hey, y'all, I hope this email finds you well, especially given the current events. I wrote this letter containing the story of Thomas Brown after watching the Unsolved Mysteries series on Netflix. This case still fires me up to this day. Something about growing up in a small town and watching one nearby experience something so detrimental just sticks with you. I have a few friends that grew up in this town and knew Tom personally. So here I am to bring a little more attention to the story. I grew up in a very small town in the panhandle of Texas. About two hours away from my hometown is another small town, Canadian, Texas, population 2,700. On November 23, 2016, the day before Thanksgiving, high school senior Thomas Brown just disappeared. Thomas Brown was a good kid who stayed out of trouble. He was thoroughly involved with high school football and the theater department. He got along well with the kids at his school and had lots of friends. The day he went missing was spent with his friends from high school, Caleb and Christian. They met up in the middle school parking lot and all jumped in Christian's car to drive around town, eventually visiting the Canadian Wagon Bridge, an old historic trestle bridge, to walk around. They decided to call it a night around 11 p.m. and were dropped off at their vehicles, going their separate ways. Tom decided to fill up his vehicle with gas at the local gas station and swiped his mother's debit card at 11.28 p.m. Although it only takes maybe five minutes to drive from one end of Canadian to the other, Tom missed his 12 a.m. curfew, which was never the case. His mother, Penny, began trying to contact him immediately. However, texts were not opened and phone calls went straight to voicemail at this point. She and her older son, Tucker, hopped in her car to drive around town in hopes of seeing Tom's vehicle. At 12.13 a.m., Tom's phone emitted what would be its final ping located at the high school football stadium. 2 a.m., Penny calms the homes of the friends Tom's had spent the day with to check if they were still together or if they had any idea where Tom may have gone. Penny mentioned she didn't call 911 because she had the number of the local sheriff's department and called dispatch instead. Being from a small town myself, I would have done the same thing. However, it took the deputy over 45 minutes to respond. Remember how I said it takes about five minutes to drive across town? There's no reason for it to be that long, especially in a normally crimeless town at 3 a.m. in the day before Thanksgiving. Fishy. Deputy Pine showed up at Penny's home around 3.30 a.m. and allowed her son, Tucker, to join him on the drive to search for Tom. They searched all over town, and Tucker noticed a gate leading to the water treatment plant that was always locked happened to be unlocked. When he brought it to Deputy Pine's attention, Pine did not drive into the area to check. When Tucker later asked about it again, Pine refused to take him back because he had to go off duty soon. They gave up the search for the night at 6 a.m., but I thought he had to go off duty soon. At 8.40 a.m. the next morning, Tom's friend Christian, who he was with the previous day, went up in the family helicopter with her father to get a bird's eye view of town. Almost immediately, they spot Tom's vehicle in, you guessed it, the water treatment plant where Deputy Pine refused to take Tucker. Bloodhounds were brought in and tracked Tom's scent about a mile into the Canadian River, but lost the scent in the marsh area. Penny mentioned there would never be any reason for Tom to visit that area of town, the sewer ponds. It was a strange place to find his vehicle. 
She also noted his backpack that contained his school laptop as well as his cell phone were missing from the vehicle, but the chargers were left behind. It was later found that various CCTV reported Tom's vehicle around town from 11.30 a.m. through 6 a.m. I do have to say I find it strange that Pine and Tucker never ran into Tom's vehicle while they were driving around the small town. Makes me wonder if Pine knew where he needed to avoid. CCTV also showed two sheriff's vehicles near the area where Tom was last seen on the night of his disappearance. One of the most frustrating things about this case for me is the way they handled the search of Tom Brown's vehicle once they found it. I know it's a small town and all, but this was just careless. First of all, gloves were not worn when collecting the items from the vehicle. Authorities from Hemp Hill County Sheriff's Department reported the findings of a debit card belonging to Tom's friend Michael, an empty 25 caliber bullet casing, and a single drop of blood. Outside of the vehicle, someone had urinated on the ground, probably obvious from a wet splatter in the sand. All the evidence was removed from the vehicle, no forensic investigation was done, and the urine on the ground was not collected. What? Then the vehicle was returned to Tom's mother within a few hours on the same day. The search for Tom was tireless. Everyone in town was looking for him. Every day. Volunteers came from surrounding towns. The treatment plant was drained and searched. The nearby lake was sonar scanned. The Canadian River was even searched all the way up into Oklahoma. People searched on foot, by car, and air for days, and nothing turned up. Let me introduce Sheriff Nathan Lewis into the mix. He was involved in the search from the beginning, but brought nothing to the table. Until he happened to show Penny a photo of Tom at the gas station where he filled his vehicle with gas the night he disappeared. Not just any photo, though. Penny said it was close up as if he took it himself. Yet Nathan claimed it was CCTV footage that was never seen. It needs to be mentioned that Nathan had been accused of harassing Tom and other young men in town in the past. It was actually addressed by the former Hemp Hill County Sheriff who knew Nathan Lewis as his deputy. While Lewis was a deputy, he had multiple complaints from people of Canadian due to his harassment of young men in town. These incidences usually consisted of traffic stops with no motive or it just seemed as if he liked to pick on Tom for some reason that is unknown. One time in particular, Tom was walking with some friends in town and Nathan stopped them, forcing Tom to get in the vehicle while questioning what he was doing. Inappropriate and unprofessional for sure. At one point early in the search, Nathan asked Penny for the passcode to Tom's phone, although it had not been found yet. Hmm. Two months after the disappearance, Tom's wet and soggy backpack was spotted in a field by a North Plains electric worker off the FM road leading to Marvin Lake nearby. The location where the backpack was found had been previously searched several times on foot and bloodhounds had been previously brought nearby, yet nothing was found. It had to have been placed there after the searches occurred. However, Sheriff Nathan Lewis commented he believed it had been there for a while. He went on to describe the bag's condition, that the bag was wet inside and out, and that there was an indention on the ground where the bag sat. I call bullshit because the ground in the Texas panhandle is hard as shit, even when wet. The pages of the book inside had begun to mold. They even found Tom's school-issued laptop inside, but due to the conditions of the bag, they were unable to access anything that was on the laptop and check for evidence. They did not find his cell phone. There was one set of indistinguishable footprints that led to the bag. Get this. Tom's mother was not notified of the discovery of his backpack until five days later. Why? I still cannot fathom how they were able to conduct this investigation so poorly. Ugh. At this time, Tom's family brought in a private investigator, Philip Klein, of Klein Investigations. 
Philip has worked with other high-profile cases in the past and is well-respected for what he does. October 2017, Almost a year after Tom went missing, Klein held a search on Lake Marvin Road near the area where Tom's backpack was found and an empty gun holster was found as well as a cell phone. The cell phone was described to be a rose gold color and there was a photo taken of it. These items were put into evidence and attached to the Tom Brown case. The woman who found the cell phone in the field took a photo of it, and spoke with Penny, Tom's mother, who identified the phone as not being Tom's because his was a gold color, not rose gold, as the photo showed. Penny, even to this day, has been unable to see the phone that is held in the evidence lab as Tom's. Remember when Sheriff Nathan asked for Tom's passcode before a phone was even found? Really makes you wonder if he has Tom's phone and threw this one out as a decoy instead. Also, after an unusually wet season with something like 22 inches of precipitation in the last few months, tell me how the cell phone had no weather damage. There was obviously conflict between Tom's family and the Hemp Hill County Sheriff's Office over the way the search was conducted, as well as things that were withheld and handled as a whole. On January 26, 2018, Sheriff Nathan Lewis put in a formal request to the Texas Attorney General's office that the case be handled over to them to take over the investigation into Tom's disappearance. Penny put out a petition with the following message, to leave no stone unturned and to bring to bear every resource the state of Texas has to solve the case of Thomas Brown. The petition reads, We respectfully request Hemp Hill County Attorney Kyle Miller and or Hemp Hill County Sheriff Nathan Lewis to turn the investigation and subsequent prosecution, if warranted, over to the Texas Attorney General's offices and let's use our tax dollars to find Thomas rather than be an adversary of his family. The petition received over 10,000 signatures and was turned over to the Texas Attorney General and Texas Rangers were brought in one month later. Remember the photo of Tom getting gas that Nathan Lewis showed Penny the night he disappeared? That photo ceased to exist after the Rangers were brought in to take over the investigation. When questioned, Nathan denied that that photo ever even existed or that he had shown anything like that to anyone. This guy is just... A liar. I just want to point out the dates here. Tom went missing November of 2016. The last break in the case was October of 2017, and the investigation was turned over in February of 2018. They went so long without finding hard evidence, they never lost hope. On January 9, 2019, Pine Gregory, the deputy who reported to the call the night Tom went missing, was out on a nearby piece of federal land searching for shed deer antlers. Might I mention this was while he was on duty at 2 a.m. Pine discovered human remains under a tree and called the Texas Attorney General to report his findings. The Texas Rangers conducted forensic investigating on the remains and confirmed them to be Tom's. Now hold up. First, explain to me why he is looking for antlers on federal land while he's on duty. Also, that winter was unusually warm, so deer wouldn't drop their antlers until a few months later. Gav was full of shit. Because of the quality of the remains, the tag was unable to determine the cause of Thomas's death, and it was considered to be a suicide. A suicide? Are you kidding me? His vehicle was found 14 miles away from where they would find his body. Blood and bullet casings were found inside the vehicle. This case had been poorly handled since the day Tom went missing. Klein investigators have openly disagreed with this statement and are still investigating the case as a homicide to this day. A few other things. When Tom went missing, Lewis told family members that Tom was gay and ran off with an older man. He also told the family it was suicide. No evidence to back these two theories up. Why did Lewis and Gregory deny volunteers and the private investigators access to the search area where Tom's remains were found? 
November 4, 2019, Klein Investigations posted photos of Tom's vehicles as it was forensically investigated with luminol. The insides of the vehicles lit up all over the driver's side as well as splatter in the passenger side of the vehicle. They brought in a cadaver dog to the vehicle, which hit on the vehicle indicated a dead body had been inside the vehicle at one point. Also, remember the debit card that was found in Tom's car that belonged to his friend Michael? Only a few days after authorities reported the findings of his remains, Michael's father, an elementary school teacher at Canadian, committed suicide, air quotes, by gun. This was investigated first by Sheriff Nathan and was reported to the media as a suicide before the medical examiner ruled it as such. In July of 2019, Moms for Tom, that's M-O-M-S, the number four, T-O-M, had large canvas signs posted in the town of Canadian with Tom's photo, a note asking for prayer of the discovery, and in the center of the poster, a killer is among us in bold lettering. Overnight, the signs were vandalized and a killer is among us was cut out, leaving large holes in the canvas. Guilty party of two? It's obvious things in Hemp Hill County are fishy. Someone knows something. And I really think the two people who have the answers to what happened to Thomas Brown are Sheriff Nathan Lewis and his deputy, Pine Gregory. These two individuals have since been investigated by the Texas Rangers. I don't know what the results of the investigations have brought. I believe it's still ongoing. Deputy Pine was fired from the Hemp Hill County Sheriff's Department a few months after discovering Tom's remains after receiving a letter from the county attorney addressing his credibility due to his past criminal history. November 2019, Nathan Lewis resigned from his position as Hemp Hill County Sheriff. Wonder why. The investigation is still heavily ongoing. June 29, 2020, Klein Investigations released a statement that read, As we are unable to give details to the public regarding the Tom Brown case at this time, we want to make this public statement. We are in the process of completing the investigation side of the case, to which my team and myself fully anticipate moving to the prosecution phase of this case sometime in near the middle or the end of the year. We want the public to know we have worked hard on this case and fully anticipate a grand jury to hear it soon. Due to moving to the prosecution phase, again, we cannot provide details. Justice will be served on swift wings, and I think it is coming rather soon. I pray today and every day that Tom's family sees those who are guilty put behind bars and finally receives the answers they so desperately are looking for. On a personal note, Amarillo, Texas is the largest city in the Panhandle to where this all took place. It is common for people in nearby cities to go there for groceries and fun activities like shopping. One day while my mom and my aunt were there to grocery shop, they ran into Tom's mother, Penny. My mom said she was simply the most graceful and hopeful woman you could ever meet. They asked her about the case at the moment, and she said although there was nothing newly public at the time, they knew they would be able to find who killed Tom. There was no doubt in her mind. Some encouraging words and big hugs were exchanged, and they went their separate ways. It says a lot about someone who can remain so hopeful after losing their son. Lastly, there's a Facebook group that was started called Moms for Tom, which I and everyone I know has followed since the beginning. There's something about a case like this happening so close to home that is so personal and infuriating. Everyone just wants to help. The Facebook page is updated anytime there is something to share and is kept respectful and professional. Penny occasionally posts messages of hope and the community of the entire Texas Panhandle gets on there and supports their family any way possible. You can also find articles related to the case and postings by the private investigators, including the luminol photos. It's really worth checking out and following. And that was sent to us anonymously. I'm pretty sure I started that podcast pretty sure i think it's like where's tom brown's body and why can i not remember that started that podcast well we know where the body is yep because uh it was in where it shouldn't have been where old boy found it when he was looking for antlers Uh on federal land while he was working for the state when he shouldn't have been that's such a heartbreaking story 
Thank you for sharing all of that with us from your like first person perspective from and sharing your opinions of, you know, again, from your first person perspective. It's pretty sketch that he like had this picture that was clearly, according to Penny, not taken from CCTV footage, the sheriff being he. And then when the Rangers came in to investigate, all of a sudden that picture doesn't exist. And he's like, I don't know what you're talking about. That's really fucking sketchy. And then what's the deal with them with the cell phone? So now they're saying, okay, we had his cell phone. And then now they're saying that that rose gold cell phone was his. I don't, I was kind of confused about the cell phone thing. Yeah, that's all around sketch. He is sketchy. And then I can't speak to how hard the Texas soil is up at the panhandle. But I feel like it should be pretty clear if a backpack had been out in the elements for that long versus had just been planted there. And again, if you had had like bloodhounds and all of that going through there, mm, they probably would have found that. All around on the sus level, what would you give it? What's my scale? Zero to ten. Ten being sus? Mm-hmm. Seven hundred. That's what I was thinking. Well, not that exact. We can do prices right. Uh, 701. I mean, that is very making a murderer. That's like the seventh time they, they go yes. into the house and, oh, look, here's her key. Yeah. Oh, it's the, sec- it's the seventh time you've checked the house <laughs> and then now you find her key like sitting right out in the... Op- okay, no. Where you weren't supposed to be there and everything else. and mm-hmm. it's- Like it really is very similar. Mm-hmm. It's really good that these stories come out, mm-hmm. but it's really scary when these stories come out because there's so many of them. And it's like this happened in 2016 2016 you know because i mean they even said in the story like i understand it's a small town so you know there's not a lot of crime like alluding to there's not a lot of crime mistakes are going to happen in an investigation kind of thing but like to not use gloves when you're searching a car is like like that's like 101 fucking bullshit you can watch reruns of anything to know that. Anything. Law and order. Come on. Yeah, that's pretty bad. That's on every fucking station. Every, like, USA. Come on. Okay, so this last one is called The House No One Wanted to Visit with Help Carved in the Walls. Hey, ladies. I have a creepy story for y'all. This is from my best friend's house with her ex-husband. When I was 21 and we were all broke, I moved into their house with them and one of his friends. These aren't their real names, but this is what I'll call them. Kelly for my best friend, Gary for her ex-husband, and Jerry for his friend. Just a time's out. I want to know how y'all pick these names. Kelly, Gary, and Jerry? Mm Mm-hmm. I swear to God, if you knew exactly like, oh, these are all characters on blah, 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 I'd be like, motherfucker. A little background on this house. It belonged to Gary's grandmother before him. It was built probably around the 1940s, and she bought it in the 50s, so there was only one owner before her. She died in the house, and with one thing and the other, the house got left to Gary when he was still in high school. In order for him to live in it, he had his dad move in with him. Now, the thing about Gary's dad, and Gary for that matter, is that they are hardcore tweakers. Gary wasn't at the time we all lived together. So this house essentially functioned as a drug den until Kelly and Gary, who dated throughout high school, got married, and Kelly told everyone to get the fuck out of the house and then started fixing things up. So now that we have the background, I can tell you about the truly horrifying discovery Kelly made as she and Gary were working on remodeling. They had two smaller closets in their bedroom, so they decided to knock the wall out between them and make a bigger one. Now, the whole house had wallpaper, including these closets, but as they had knocked out the wall, they started pulling out the wallpaper. Behind the paper was wood paneling. Inside the smaller closet, under the wallpaper, carved into the wood over and over and over again, were the words, help me, in the entire closet, y'all. It was truly horrifying. Holy shit. That gives me chills just thinking about that. Like, that's not a, like a little kid, like, just doing that for fun. No, mm-mm. no that, that, like, somebody was held. Yeah. So, despite knowing this and knowing the house had some less than favorable energy, I still moved in. 21 and dumb. 
The room I got was separated from most of the house. It was up at the front, and I actually had my own door in and out. And it connected to the rest of the house by this creepy-ass hallway. Everyone in the house hated this hallway. Of course, that's where the one bathroom was, so going into it was unavoidable. There were no lights or windows in it, but shadowy forms were seen in it multiple times. After moving in, I started struggling a lot more with depression. My fiancé, then boyfriend, dreaded being in that space, and I had some friends who refused to enter the house because you could feel the negative energy from the street. Anyways, during this time, my boyfriend would come over after work on his Friday, stay his two days off, and then go home for the rest of the week after that. He worked late, so he would often get to my house around midnight or one at this time. So because of all of this, I knew it was around two in the morning when this happened. I often tried to avoid using the bathroom at night. I hated leaving the relative safety of my room for that creepy hallway, which that help me closet was behind sharing the wall with that bathroom. But I had to go. So I go into the hallway and I try the door locked. Okay, well, I did have three roommates. Granted, I didn't hear anyone on the creaky floorboards, but whatever. I went back to my room, waited five to ten minutes, and went back. Still locked. And I can hear water running. Okay, fine, I guess someone's showering. Rinse and repeat, another ten minutes, I go back. This time, I knock. Hey, I really need to pee, are you going to be much longer? No answer. Hey, nothing. Now, Jerry, the fourth roommate, was a weird guy. That's a different story for a different day. So I think, okay, maybe it's him, and he just doesn't want to talk to me. (laughs) Jerry rhymes with Carrie. I'm just saying. (laughs) And that sounds like something she would do. Whatever. I would answer you. Yeah. 20 minutes later, I go back. I am bursting, y'all. Pee dance and everything. Water still running. I knock, try the door repeatedly. My boyfriend tries the door and knocks and absolutely nothing. We ended up going up the street to a store for me to pee. Oh God, just pee in the yard. (laughs) I was annoyed, but didn't find it overly weird until the next day I asked Kelly, hey dude, were you or Gary in the bathroom for a few hours last night? And she says, no, we went to bed around 10. She's a light sleeper and would wake up anytime Gary so much as moved. So I said, oh, I guess it was Jerry. And she said, no, he's been out of town. He won't be back for another few days. I nearly shat my pants, y'all. That door was locked from the inside. The water was running for hours. Following this, also prompted by a hole in my wall, shared wall to the bathroom covered with tile, I did a sage ceremony in my room and in the hall and buried the ashes. I also drew salt line on my doorways to keep the bad energy and spirits out. It helped in my room. I felt safer in my space, but it had no effect on the rest of the house. I only lived there for six months, and there's so much more I could tell you. But this email is already very long. I hope y'all enjoyed reading about my creepy experiences. Keep it creepy. Yours from Texas, Sharice. And you can use my name if you'd like. Sharice, the creepiest part of that fucking email is not being able to pee. Okay, one... Is the hallway, because I hate hallways. Dark hallways freak me the fuck out, a.k.a. carries. I'd have peed in the yard. Yeah. Well, I would have peed myself trying to get anywhere. True. But, like, legit, I would have squatted in the yard. I would have had to. Well, I'm glad you got the fuck up at that house. Uh, yeah. But being locked from the inside. Oh, that's weird. And the water running. You heard the water, but nothing happened. Like, there was no water running, because it would have flooded. Or it was just running through the bathtub or the sink, and why are you running up my water bill? True. So not only can I not pee, you're costing me money. And you're making me want to pee more because the water sounds. It's a fucking triple whammy. No whammy, no whammy, stop. But don't stop sending in your emails. Because y'all fucking killed it, and we are through with this year. Hell yeah. Just like y'all are through with all these fucking stories. Y'all did amazing with your stories. Y'all know y'all always fucking do. Y'all the best. Keep on sending them in so that my butthole doesn't have to pucker anymore. <laughs> Besides when we read them and we're like, oh my God. Yeah, yeah. Oh that's a, but that, well, that's, that's a good kind of pucker. That's yeah, not a, that's oh a God, good we, pucker. Yeah, that's not a, are we going to have to run out of stories pucker? Yeah. We're not running out of them, but I get worried. I'm a worrier. Yes, you are. Well, keep the stories coming. Send them in, aparanormalchicks at gmail.com. 
Thank y'all so much for another amazing year of Sinister Sightings. Like, what the fuck? I know. Can't wait to see what y'all's stories are like in 2021. Yes. Joke's on y'all. We've already got them. (laughs) (laughs) We haven't read them. I'm just kidding. (laughs) Oh, joke's on us. Like, all the shit's gonna like... Shh! (laughs) Are you fucking kidding? You just Tiffany'd that. Our email's about to crash. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. Her butthole puckered. Oh, my God. Okay. Well, BR, BRB, y'all. Let me go uh, try to reclaim all of our emails. So, uh, y'all remember. Creep it real. And, and don't, don't get scared. scared.